Hello friends, and welcome to Talking with Famous People. I'm host Derek, and this is my beloved life partner and wife, Rachel. And together, we're talking today with you and famous people about things related to MBTI and typology. So, I don't know if I really come in here today with a clear central thesis. And that's perhaps is to discuss a possible mechanic that I've been thinking about and I'm not quite sure make good sense. Namely, is it possible that people most express the aspect of their third function, which is to say subject, agent, object, dependent on the first two functions? So like I go subject function, object function, so my third function I first and foremost express as an agent function, perhaps. Rachel goes agent function, then subject function. So her third slot function she mostly expresses as an object or tends to as an object. It's a, uh, it's a possible mechanics that kind of makes sense. It would explain the deviation between different people on these things. Like third slot doesn't always seem to correlate to... Um, to subject or agent or whatever it kind of depends on the kind of function it is and stuff like that so it's something i was thinking of that may maybe make some sense thank you winston's mom it's urban decay elote is does that mean what does that mean in spanish do you know elote is that fire well i was thinking about this quite a bit as well legends fall it's a good question to ask like how exactly do I distinguish between subject and agent? But the conclusion I came is that <coughs> I'm much more I'm much more happy. <coughs> I'm much happier knowing that something I've done withstands FE scrutiny than I am actively being the object of FE in the moment. So, in other words. Receiving praise directly is always kind of a challenge. Uh, it's kind of a mixed, a mixed kind of bag of emotional responses for me. Whereas knowing that something succeeds on those metrics that I've done is much more meaningful to me. Also, when I do, when I do receive FE as an object, it's more. Uh, um, vicarious, like I'll get good FE from something I'm watching and enjoy that. Sometimes it can be laid on too thick. In other words, I'm appreciating it being done well, I guess, but I'm also judging about it a lot. So it, it's kind of hard to distinguish. It's, it's kind of a hard thing to distinguish between, um, especially given that some functions are inherently agential and some are, are so it's like, Explaining how an interface function is agential presents one sort of challenges. Explaining how an uh, action function is agential produces another set of challenges. Can you explain what you mean by as an object? Well, so I could say something very snarky to you that was directing sort of antagonistic FE at you to make you look or feel bad or to establish my own higher superiority or whatever, right? And that, I mean, it's easy to understand what, as an object, is when we're talking about SE. If I punch Rachel, she's the object. If she punches me, she's the subject. If we watch somebody else punch somebody else, we're the agent, right? So it's really easy to understand SE in terms of agent, subject, object. But that's because that's where the where the the distinction exists first and foremost is on the physical world like that, right? That you can be a witness or a perpetrator or a victim is basically what it, it explains. Um, but uh, on other on other functions, it's harder to articulate so clearly in ways that people have. Yeah, right. 
But see, with like with a function like f- extra feeling, so it's like showing that that the agency part of it is probably the most absolute value for me could be expressed as why even if I can see the given movie is funny, I maybe can't watch it because it induces too much cringe. I'm too busy knowing the the bad part of the FE and too little being the object, the intended object of it. You know, it's like I'm intended to 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 be an agent, but I'm expected to respond to it differently than I am, right? So as an agent, I'm supposed to acknowledge that I'm not those people. I don't have, I don't have to experience the awkwardness that they're experiencing, but uh, I'm not, I'm not very good at drawing those distinctions, I guess you could say. So I'm not sure how, how clearly this, this mechanics plays out because it's very difficult to describe for some functions and easy to describe for other functions. I nevertheless believe it, it is the case that it's a real, it's a real trichotomy, so to speak. Like um, being an agent <coughs> of extroverted intuition means basically informing my 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 research by noting things that are worth noting, right? So it's like I'm very good at finding finding the bits of a thing that are worth keeping and tossing away everything else. You might think this is an introverted intuition kind of a thing, but it really isn't. It's, uh, it's, it's instead actively looking for new shiny things and that you can link in with other new shiny things. I don't have any MJCs, Fyug Hug Kyuk. I don't have any. So I have to, unfortunately, decline that proposition. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, like, email me or, uh, or, what's that thing called? What's Signal. There's this app called Signal that I'm on. Should I follow you on that? No, no, it's like a, a privacy thing. Cool. It's like a a way to be paranoid about things. I like scoring FE three pointers. The selfish descriptor for the F third slot rings true for me. I want all the FE for myself. I don't get annoyed, angry by people who are not good at FE, but I do get a little freaked out by people who give no FE feedback at all. So it's like that's that's described that last bit's describing me and INFPs. Um How do I know you're not confusing your any with your ignoring an I? Please explain. Okay, so Fate Wind, that question is a good question to ask because it's revelatory of how a lot of people angle their understanding of things wrong, backwards. So, ignoring an I is another way of saying dominant NE. Eighth slot SE is another way of saying dominant NE. Fourth slot SI is another way of saying dominant NE. All of those um, those those things, those words we say, are expressions of what it means to be an NE dom. So how how do I know whether I'm not confusing my extroverted intuition dominant with my introverted intuition ignoring? That's like saying how am I not converting confusing my extroverted intuition dominant with with another aspect of an introverted intuition dominant? Well, those those distinctions we make are mostly ways of understanding how it impacts your usage of a given function compared against somebody using it in the dominant function. So it's uh, it's a way of, of clarifying what we're talking about, but it's important to remember that an extroverted intuiter and a fifth slot NI ignorer and an eighth slot SE person and a fourth slot SI person are all the same person you're talking about. And it's all the same cognitive function stack. In other words, you can't understand your relationship with that, with extroverted intuition as a dominant function without defining it in terms of introverted intuition ignoring and extroverted sensing eighth slot and introverted sensing fourth slot to have a full explanation of it. Because those are the three things that it implies, right? Um, so, but anyway, what Legends Fall, what you're describing there is what I feel with INFPs is this sense of, I can't tell whether I'm doing 
a good job or not. Whatever the answer is, I can adjust. But if I'm not giving any feedback at all, then I feel lost, like, okay, how am I supposed to know how to proceed? Is that because it's supervisory? Yeah, supervisorial. That INFP, ENTP supervisorial quality for me expresses exactly what Legends Paul says right there. Uh, I do get a little freaked out by people who give no FP feedback at all. Right. And for you, that's, I guess, ISFP is your corollary there. For me, it's ENTJ. Oh my god. I remember when I was um, promoted to paralegal, like an ENTJ walked in on it like haphazardly. And he like wanted to know all these like facts about me and he was like thinking I was like some like, big shot. It was like so, and I found myself like lying like to like impress him and it made me feel weird because I hadn't been lying. Oh, it was so weird. Yes, I see Squid Game. It's excellent. So I told me to watch it a couple of times before I actually got to watch, got into watching it. But once I did, uh, I finished it pretty quickly. Got through the whole thing. Okay, you peacocks need to get away. We are not making this a daily thing with all of you guys. You need to shoo, shoo, shoo. Anyway. Yeah, just shoo, shoo, shoo. I want you to shoo like the thing on my foot. Um, so, the thing is, when we're thinking about cognitive functions in general, it's, it's a challenge because if we're going to break down our descriptions of a cognitive function into categories of descriptions, we're really talking about describing how it plays out as a subject, an agent, or an object. So, if I talk about NI... You know, taking what SE brings in, a bunch of clues, and then collapsing them down into a single conclusion, aha moment. Well, that's a very subject presentation of NI. So, um, somebody said in a live stream yesterday about the ISFP, uh, I mean, a premiere. Um, wouldn't that aha moment thing be more con conducive? How would you distinguish between first slot and third slot there? And I'd say, well, I mean, NI is naturally an agent function. So it's it's naturally operating in a somewhat different way than that for people who have it in the dominant dominant function. It's like there's an openness to to seeing the realities of things. It doesn't it doesn't manifests so much as an aha thing in them. It's just the natural way of seeing things. So, um, when, but when, when we, oh, that was you who, who asked that question. Um, when we, uh, <coughs> when we think about The thing is, the most natural way to test people is to test them in, in their displays as subjects, right? So for some functions, that's going to be easier done than for others, or easier, more completely or fully realized than for others. Uh, for, some, for functions that are naturally subject functions, you can probably see a lot of the subject uh, aspect of those. And so it's going to be a tendency to mistype, say, FE's tool people as FE DOMs because you're seeing so much subjectiness out of them because you can you can easily get garner it but <clears throat> i would argue that um it does seem to make the most sense that from a if you think of your first second third and fourth functions as basically varying degrees of complexity with which you engage with that modality of attention okay that are necessitated by your first and second functions then your third slot function is limited 
is limited to to maximally attain on one of those three vectors really and your fourth it, even then is, is sort of like only is never going to do better than mediocre on one of those three vectors and I'm not sure if the second one sort of has a backup vector I think it does I think you can like muster subject or object FE stuff um, as circumstances demand but it, you'd rather you, you generally don't value those aspects of it very much if, for, if you're third slot FE. You much more value knowing what the scorecard says about FE, at least I do, with NE. This may, again, be linked to the fact that I'm an intuitive first, so I'm meanings first and statuses first, uh, rather than experience first. The three vectors are subject, agent, object. Basically, doing shit, having shit done to you, or witnessing. And... Attention works in the same way it's that SE does. All attentional language works in the same way that SE does. Acting as a subject with extroverted intuition is the natural way to extrovertedly intuit. Um, so you see me doing that plenty, right? And then acting as an object is the natural way for me to express TI, which is, if you saw the conversation between me and the and the INTP about Buddhism, Christianity, and stuff. Who was doing all the question asking, and who was and who was making the more, more of the case? He was making much more case. I was asking many more questions, and I was I was trying to pin him down, right? So if third slot, then that would mean you typically feel like an object in terms of TI for third slot. You're checking to make sure that you're not being subjected to unfairness, basically. But, um, Rachel, how do you experience third slot TI? <laughs> um. Look at this shit. It's ridiculous. Oh, <laughs> he went away. <laughs> there was a baby peacock who was, like, about to come inside to get food. Oh. So, how do you experience your third slot TI, Rachel? Well, like specific, I have a specific memory of uh, like Christmas being something that I, and birthdays, like they had to be fair. Oh my gosh, we could get the, the, the show the peacocks now. All right. <clears throat> Here, let me. Oh, no, no, it's okay. All right. Yeah, stay. It's all right. We don't have food, I'll but. I'll give you some food, Peacocks. Okay, I'll find you some food. We do have something. Oh, yeah, we do have some the, in the blue bag. Yeah, but I can't bring the camera. Oh, over, I, see. I was thinking. It's too hard. Unscrewing it. Oh, yeah, I could unscrew it. That's a good point. You're so smart, your TE is better than mine. You out TE'd me, Rachel. Thanks a lot for emasculating me. I'm just kidding. I don't really feel emasculated by that. I'm glad. I feel glad that Rachel came up with a good idea that things could possibly solve this problem. Come closer. I'll tell you what. I will uh, put the food right here. You see the kitty friend? You see the kitty friend? She's the kitty badger winner, guys. And what we're gonna see here is, is the peacocks come in and battle the, for the, with the cap for the food. <laughs> that's pretty exciting. This is exciting. Yeah, that's for you. Well, I would say that, that your TI third, your kitty, move out of the way and let, let, let the peacocks have your food, okay? Put it down there. You have to come up here and eat it. 
All right, so we're going to let them eat it. <laughs> They'll come up here in a second, I think, and realize that we're not bringing them the food down there. So when I say operationalized terms, <laughs> what I mean is... Okay, so here's an example. If if um, you ask me to define hmm. type, I will say a type is a configural strategy towards attaining the prime directive. And so then we'll define prime directive. Well, the prime directive is closing the distance between map and territory and or expectations and realities, basically. Um, so then each of the configurations that I say it comprises a strategy should be able to express in those terms. If it can't express in those terms, then it's not it's not meaningfully defined as an example of that set of things, okay? <coughs> if I say uh, extroverted feeling is defined as creativity, then... To meaningfully have that definition be operationalized, I need to contrast it against something that is non-creative, namely repetition of that which has already been created. So to the extent that I'm spending a certain amount of attention repeating that which has already been created, then I am not spending that same attention um, coming up with new things. However, there's also a complicated relationship between having already created, quote-unquote, a concept or an idea or a gist of something, the NI identity of an explanation, versus the actual words that comprise the explanation, which I tend to recreate anew every time. It's not like I'm reading the same script over and over again. I may say some common <coughs> sets of words <coughs> when I'm explaining something, but uh, but by and large, I'm... I guess they've given up. They don't want to come up here and eat it. Which is a little bit annoying, but... Say la vie. Come up here. Come on. Come on, peacocks. Come on. I don't know. They might still be coming up here. I'm going to be patient for a second. Maybe if I... Sprigly, sprigly the sound of this. Does like, anyone want... A card reading? Would you like one, Eric? A card? Sure. Eric, do you not think that it's difficult to argue that the person you spoke to about Buddhism and Christianity is not an ENFP? Ooh. Um, I... That's the card for me? Yeah. Seven of Swords, Betrayal, Exploit, Guile, Unethical. Huh. Well, I don't know what to make of that. Um, I wasn't really thinking about the person's type, to be honest. Uh, I would say that he didn't exactly run away from my negations. Uh, <coughs> he just tried to reframe them all, which... I, I don't know. It was to me the conversation was the conversation. He self-identified as INTP. I wasn't thinking about whether he was. However, I would say that in the course of the conversation, I wasn't struck dramatically by by the total absence of TI as I would expect to be if it were in the NFP. But like I said, it wasn't on my mind when I was talking to him. Really, it's not really relevant to what he's saying, you know. I mean, I found it, obviously, I mean, there's an inherent frustration when people are attempting to express things that purportedly are irreducible truths, but really what that means is they're purporting to say things without you being able to meaningfully conclude that they're saying anything, you know? And so, it's, it's like... Oops. Nice catch. Thank you. Um.
Okay. Let's see how that looks once I get it. Yeah, it's a little a little wiggly wobbly. Hmm. Still a little wiggly wobbly. Maybe if I put on this light here. Will that help? Maybe if I close this door. Will that help? Ooh, two cards fell out. Uh, that's gonna have to do. Marriage. And conflict strife. Betrayal, conflict, strife, and marriage? Those are three strange cards for me to get. Maybe they're not yours. You choose yours. Um, well, I mean, I may have said he seemed to be an HP, but I may have been saying he seemed more NE than TI, you know, which, if he's an ENFP, it's more correct to say that he seems like an ENTP than he seems like an INTP, right? Yeah. I mean, like reading. fourth is what you're always under, you know, fourth is, is, uh, if you did more of it, you'd be balanced, but you never do. I guess that's the quickest in our way to put it. If you did more of it, you'd be balanced. If you did a lot more of it. <laughs> By the two main branches of Buddhism. Sanyata and the Four Noble Truths by the two main branches of Buddhism. There's Sanyata and the Four Noble Truths. Noble Truth 1. Hey, hey, hey. Noble Truth 2. shabba dabba -doo. Noble Truth 3. He, he, he. Noble Truth 4. There's the door. Noble Truths. That's a famous Buddha, Buddhist chant they did in the monasteries back in the day. I yeah, to teach the monks the, the Four Noble Truths. I like that. Can you do a reading for us? Sure, I will, darling. It's a reading for me and Rachel and our love. Uh-oh. <gasps> Uh-oh. Conflict. What else? Benefit reward. And what else? Achievement passage evolution. What are we conflicting about? What do you wanna what do you wanna fight about? <laughs> Four noble truths. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a great Buddhist hymn. What do you make of this? It is. My darling, that we're gonna have a fight, but it ultimately will evolve beyond it into yeah. achievement. Yeah. What are we going to fight about, though? Let's choose now. Let's, okay, let's choose. Let's fight about tomatoes. Tomatoes. Do you want to be fruit or not fruit? So that's a famous unanswerable question. Okay, I'll say they're not fruit. Tomatoes aren't fruit. Yes, they are. Uh, no, no, they're not. Yes, they are. I think we learned a lot. I did. I did. You know, that's one thing you can say about conflict that it teaches you a lot. Yeah. 
And that's why I'm conflict avoidant. Because you don't like the wiring. <laughs> How about uh, we do a reading for the channel real quick? Yeah. Are you going to interview Skids McGee on Buddhism? Uh, if he wants, sure, I'll do that. I saw that comment. I didn't respond to it, I don't think. What's his name? Oh, this is for the channel. Ooh, Wheel of Fortune. Wheel of Fortune. Apprenticeship. Ooh, three pence. And... Oh, I got two. Hanged Man. Ooh. And King of Rods. So... Kind of a mixed bag of yum yes, I'd say. If you're into tarot, divining things, then you would divine the mixed bag of yum yum. When I don't like what Tara says, I just ignore it. Yeah, me too. Shreds McGee, that's his but name. But I do, I, I go to you and I tell you about it. <laughs> okay, so the thing is, I don't know what there is really to say about <coughs> about Buddhism in general. I'm sure that <coughs> I'm sure that whatever I might say based on my perceptions of it are could easily be refuted by somebody who's got more expertise in the matter than I. But in general, my takeaway regarding it is that it's it's either holistic. That's a terrible place to put that, Richard. <laughs> I should put it over there on this little stool thing, like you like usually this? do. No. On here. Yeah, that's the place. It'd be cool to have a series of photos, just called like Rachel puts things terrible places. <laughs> like, you know, let me balance this thing full of water on top of this. That's a good idea. Maybe we'll fight about that, me making that joke there. Did I really hurt your feelings when I made that joke about that thing? <laughs> no, because it's true. And I wanted to learn about INFJ stuff. Could you turn that on? Yeah. Do you want the other one on too? Yeah, let's try it with the other one on too. Doesn't help much, huh? No. I guess I'm gonna have to adjust the um, chroma mia. Eric, if a TE person is shown a more efficient and practical way of doing a task, to what extent are they able to understand that the suggested way is more efficient than their own? I mean, I think if if you put TE, if they're t you're talking TE dominant, then they're very capable of doing that. So it's like when people do come up with good ideas that that. I can build off of or add or connect in ways to things that are not m are my own ideas. I have no problem incorporating them. I'm not like uh, I'm not like too egoy about it in that regard. I guess. Chroma key, why have you failed me? Is that now better, G? Can you see my face behind me, We, You should see some leaves and stuff blowing around all over the place. Hooray, 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 hooray. There we go. So, it's like... It, the thing is, when you're talking about testing for cognitive functions, and you're considering this agent-subject-object thing, it would seem that agency correlates most frequently with the values questions. So, it's like, if I'm asking you, what do you think is... If I'm, in some one way or another, asking you, 
which of the following is absolute and which of the following is instrumental? And you're answering me yeah, as absolute that I'm, my hypothesis here is that you're also answering that um, that you you treat that function probably more as an agent, right? And less as a subject or an object. So an example of how agency might express differently than subjecthood Hello. Hello, Mrs. Strauss. Hi. Hi. What's going on? Seven? Okay. All right, sure. Bye. Okay. Close all there. All right. <clears throat> so, oh, TE polar. If TE polar is shown a more efficient and practical way of doing a task, to what extent are they able to understand that the suggested way is more efficient than their own? I don't know, Rachel. Uh, like, when I tell you don't do it like that, do it like this, what do you think? <laughs> uh, that you're parenting me a little bit. Okay, so can you think of an example of something that I've done that to about? The only thing that I, well, you know this. <laughs> I'm not very quiet about, like, anything like that. I don't find that we frequently have those conversations. But the, uh, how to do coffee, how to make the coffee. But I didn't need to know, so it was useful information. I don't remember. Did you ask me, or did you just sort of like stand around there and look like you didn't know what you were doing? <laughs> That's a good question. I but I frequently do that though, stand around and be at like being like, what do I do here? Uh. But I mean, with that coffee pot, it's like it's interesting because at first it took me a while to figure out. Like, okay, this actually does fit into this this heater part. It just kind of clicks into place. Um, and I had previously told Rachel something wrong about it. So I wanted to, I need to correct that as well. Like I had, I had, uh, I, I don't think I felt took anything personal here. I don't know what, what you're referring to even. But um, if I did, I don't know. Uh, what should he take personal? I don't know. You put things I'm in precarious thought spots, but then don't knock things over. That's that does sound like SE saving you from bad TE. Yeah. Me. Hmm. Legends fall. Uh. So you want to answer more about that TE TE polar question? Uh. Well, I definitely will say that I do. If I. I have a task to do, but I don't know how to do it. I do find myself being like kind of frozen and like, uh, I do not do, I know what to do. Mm. So what did you think about me asking you to take care of the dishes today? Well, my, my ESTJ mom taught me how to, um, to, like load the dishwasher so I knew to wash beforehand also you know because that's the ESTJ way of doing it and then um, I put some of them in but my question I did have a question while we were doing it was do we have to go in and ask then like if uh, I go make soup or whatever 
I'll just ask you, Dad, if I could borrow a bowl. Oh, no, I mean, we can get a new bowl. I just wanted to get the dishes cleared out of here and just sort of start over. It's like, um, we kind of accumulate dishes a little bit. Not a lot, but a little bit of dishes. We generally try to reuse the dishes we have out here. But I just wanted to start over afresh. I was, I'm planning on probably cleaning that surface. So I didn't want any dishes on there. I thought this would be the best way to start afresh. What is that weird black spot on me? Right here. Oh, it's, a, <laughs> it's a spot of sunlight. Oh, yeah, it is. It's paranormal. Hey, guys, look, it's a ghost. <laughs> it's a paranormal ghost. You're the ghost. I mean, there's no other explanation. It's a flying saucer. You know, on my chest. You know, I really enjoy the paranormal caught on tape, but some of it's more convincing than others, you know. Yeah. You know, it's not plates. We use paper plates. We try to, uh... We try to... Use disposable stuff. But, um... You know, it's like... It's hard. We don't really have disposable bowls for making soup, so we end up using a bowl. Uh... And we'll run out of disposable cups, and then, you know, it's been a while until we get more disposable cups, etc., etc. I mean, either way, Elise, is it better to save the water, or is it better to, to keep the landfills empty? Damn to be do, damn to be don't, you know? You might say, well, it costs a lot of water to make those things, but the places where they make those things then have a lot of water supply to make them with. So, you know, your location ge geographically matters, too. It's like, is it environmentally friendly to plant trees? Well, not in Los Angeles, where there's not enough natural water for them. I agree. I think, Os I think uh, Oliver Linehan's got it right. It's a tiny Sasquatch. You can see its dark shape kind <laughs> of coming in and out of you. <laughs> it is. <laughs> What's clearly a humanoid figure walking through through the marsh, emitting stink lines like a skunk ape. Best way to save the trees: cut out beef from South America. You know what they say. You can take the beef out of South America, but you can never get the South America out of the beef. Rachel and I eat a lot of environmentally friendly foods. We eat a lot of pork and beef. Mm -hmm. um, occasionally we'll, we'll dabble in the, the field of chicken. I kind of feel like I could use some vegetables. <laughs> I've eaten nothing but meat for days. Just steak and or ribs. We had ribs yesterday. You don't eat meat. How environmentally unfriendly of you. Just think. What's more green? A plant or an animal? Plants. They have chlorophyll. And there's this electricity in the air. You can almost hear it, right? And this bag was just dancing with me. Like a little kid begging me to play with it. What's that a quote from? Is that from American Beauty? The thing, the good thing you know about eating cows and pigs and chickens is that their, their whole... I, I nailed it. Boom! Bam! Bang! Bang! Boom! I nailed it. I nailed it. Well, Legends Fall. High five. Pew. Um, why should we conserve the rainforest? More CO2 is causing the earth to become more green. We should conserve the rainforests because that's where all the biodiversity is. Smitty Werb and Jagger and Jensen. Okay. Quit shitting on biodiversity. I'm tired of it. 
I love biodiversity. <laughs> Unless it's COVID. I don't like that kind of biological diversity at all. <laughs> I, I, gotta, I want that to go extinct. It biodiversified your mom. You just want to get permission from the Navajo tribe? Just say you're a Navajo. Do you feel Navajo? Yeah. Or say you're an Apache who used to be, um, who used to be a Seminole transitioned into, uh, an Inuit and finally has emerged like a butterfly from its chrysalis as a full-blown Navajo. <laughs> all right. If you weren't eating all this cow's food supply, I wouldn't have to eat it. It wouldn't be it wouldn't be necessary to call the herd. I feel like I look like I am in black and white except for my lips. You do you do look <laughs> rather rather pale, so do I I guess. I'm not a lot of color. <laughs> Navajos.com is a great name for a Native American themed <coughs> pornography channel. <coughs> the difference between ENFPs with the best TI and ENFPs with the worst TI? ENFPs with better TI don't continue to fight things they're wrong about forever and just sort of just sort of either move away to other topics or or whatever. In other words, they don't they don't catastrophically <coughs> bumblefuck their way into a, <coughs> a quagmire of toxic fi unself aware fi. You know, Eric. Did some polar farmers more than others display a larger range of possible performances, e.g. Is the difference between INFJs with the best TE and INFJs with the worst TE larger than ENFJs with the worst TI and ENFJs with the worst TI? No, I mean, the thing is, the thing to remember about it is, uh, it's very, it's very misleading to try to measure from outcomes. So, like, if, if you say, well, this INFJ has accomplished these sort of outcomes, Um, that are consistent with TE, then you may be totally wrong because they very very well may have gotten there by FE. The thing is, increasingly the world allows you to get to where TE gets you by FE. What I mean by that is, if you're trying to figure out how to... Connect to the dark web so you can use crypto to buy illicit substances or something. Then you can probably get just as far by asking the right people on Reddit as you can in any other fashion. You know, it's more about knowing who to ask, when to ask. Hi, Kevin. Well, you certainly are bucking the trend by reappearing. <laughs> How do you manipulate your boss into giving you a raise? What type is your boss? The answer is basically <coughs> you want to make them feel as though failing to give you a raise is equivalent to them failing on their six slot function in a public fashion. Well, if you, if you have a perfect TE test, um, then presumably 
they perform equivalently on it if you provide enough test. So it's like if if the underlying theory is right, then if you can if you can link TE to a bunch of specific tests and give enough examples of those tests, then whatever differences might display in a small sample of test questions will even out over time amongst the INFJs, by and large. Because, I mean, it's, it's always going to be the case that there's some variation within a type, but in terms of test abilities of a polar, it you know, it tests, to the extent that you can successfully link it to skills, it's going to show an, an absence of those skills or an inability even to frame things through the reference frame of those skills. How do I test for TE polar? Well, one of the interesting, interestingly consistent kind of results I get is that um, when I ask, when I ask TE polar types to break a commonplace task into five or six steps, They'll often start with, well, first you need to know, like let's say I say take out the trash in six steps. They'll say, well, first you need to know where the trash can is. And then you, you probably need to know whether it's full or not. And you need to know, now these are not steps of taking out the trash, right? They are um, steps to, to, steps to knowing about whether you take out the trash, right? <laughs> So it's it's like TE polar in an INFJ or an ISFJ will often express as first mis apparently misunderstanding the question, answering what you need to know in advance before you instructed somebody on how to take out the trash, rather than giving instructions on how to take out the trash. I'm going to take out your trash. <laughs> I think she means something by that other than taking out my trash. I already took out the trash, so. Actually, I need to take it out to the curb now. I mean, it is possible. It, it certainly is possible to exploit what you know about MBTI to meaningfully interface with other people and, expect, and predictably get results that you expect. So what I said is true. If you really want to manipulate somebody... The best thing to do is to get them to understand their failure to do what you want them to do as a fail as a public failure on their six slot function. Alternately, you could do it as a public failure on their third, but they're much more likely to get defensive about that. On their six, they're just likely to crumble. So, let's say you got an ESTJ. If you can get him to a spot where he said he was going to do something and failed to follow through on it, and you can point these two things out, you've got him and he'll crumble. Because you're hitting him on his his six slot function as it expresses as as part of its definition of the second slot function. <laughs> uh, I think Jonathan has a point there, Rachel. I'm gonna take out your trash, girl. You gotta throw a girl at the end of it. It's just like this. When you say move it or lose it. You always have to add sister at the end of it, no matter who ah, you're saying it to. Thank you. Move it or lose it, sister. So it's, I'm going to take out your trash, girl. Yeah, like that. Ethical manipulation for the betterment of the in interactions of everyone, for everyone, is kosher in my book. I mean, the thing is, I am I am loath to, to exploit people's ways in general, without informing them of those ways, right? Like, uh, but but there's there are plenty of times when it's just not possible to, to be like that, you know? It's like uh, people can only understand so much. You in, in an ethically perfect world, everybody who makes every decision would be fully informed. But in a reality-based world, only some people are capable of being fully informed to the extent that you say fully informed is as informed as me about me. If it's something that I'm very informed about, well, I, you know, 
you can't you can't host a a class that everybody has to take before they before they make any decisions in, in order to make sure that everybody is as fully informed as you are in their decision making. Yes. I wanna I wanna form a club of nine seven fours for changing the name of the tri type named the self doubter. What would you like to change it to? I don't know. That's the thing. If you don't have anything to change it to, it's like how could you change it? How about the Soul Checker? The Soul Checker, I'll take that. It's a pretty good name. Yeah, the Soul Checker. Thanks. I like that one. I like it better. Playing a clean pro social game is a stronger strategy in the long run. Well, I mean, the thing is, it, yeah, you want. The problem is. Anytime certain actions get taken that aren't fundamentally justified, there can come a point where others are well positioned to exploit that reality, you know? The best way to avoid having those realities be exploitable is to always stay out in front of them. So it's like, uh, if, if there's an area where <laughs> that's that's great, Kevin. That's fantastic. <laughs> I mean, is there really a best time to betray someone? Yeah, that's a weird, <laughs> weird uh, yeah. statement. I mean, I guess you could say there's the most self-serving time to betray someone. Um, my, th I don't. I'm not a six. I'm definitely a seven out of that tri type. Out of five, six, seven, I'm a seven. Um, and I'm a nine, seven, four. And that tri type is called the self doubter. So that's fun, but it's not that anymore it's the soul soul checker checker because the thing is like copy <laughs> you meant it like that i meant like appraiser because the thing is there's oh. there's a misunderstanding in the, the self doubter is the basically the identity doubter it's not just the self they doubt it's identities in general so it, it's um at least that's how i see it in rachel it's it's like uh, I, I'm definitely a self-doubter, but I'm not so much of an identity doubter. In other words, I set a standard of proof that I can meet. Whereas I think Rachel doubts the doubts the legitimacy of identities as fundamentally meaningful because she's an NI dom and, as a consequence, has a complicated relationship with it in general. You know, it's like, just as an NI dom, I... I don't. I get it when expert intuition is not valuable, and when it's not to be used, and when using it is counterproductive. So true with an NI dom and NI, and so uh, I don't remember where I started that sentence. How do you know if you're eight wing seven or seven wing eight? I've asked this question before, Legends Fall, and. I, my answer to this is I don't use wings because I can't meaningfully get a good answer to that. I mean, the answer I got from this last guy I talked to was basically seven wing eight is a flavor of seven. And then eight is, is your second thing in the tri-type. So it's like I play a certain way maybe because I'm seven wing eight versus another different kind of way if I'm seven wing six. I mean, personally, I don't really buy it. It's like, I play both ways. I, I, I play a lot of ways. Sometimes I play in very friendly and, like, comfortable 
ways and sometimes I play in very adversarial ways and it really depends on my mood, you know? My mom is showing her one oneness today. I was like, oh my gosh. Well, if you're in Chi-Chi, I mean, there are, there is, on Personality Cafe, somebody's gone through and named each of the, uh, the varieties of the tri-types. So, in other words, they've, they've named 479, 794, mm -hmm. uh, 947, 974, and they've given them each different names. So, it, yeah, it's so like, it's that's, where, that's where we're getting these names from. Mm-hmm. Well, Peter Dantici, I mean, this is the problem of the Negrum in general, is it doesn't really validate against anything outside of itself, particularly. It doesn't, because we're dealing with feelings, it's not something that, that uh, crunches down to, to binaries very well. And so it's kind of, it's kind of an arbitrary taxonomy in a way that cognitive functions are, are not. Our cognitive functions represent a, a simulatable model that has an internal logic that can't be any other way or else it will malfunction. It doesn't really work that way with, with an egram that it's a lack of consensus and or good argumentation on any side as to why it should be meow versus meow interpretation. Hi Luke Eden. How's it going? Um does try type change? So mine has changed like directions by getting to know me better. Um, I originally tested as type seven, but as we've come to live together longer, Eric believes that I am more sloth than gluttonous, so that would make me a nine ahead of a seven. And then I'm a four because I say, fuck are you, you know. Yeah, she's more of a sloth than a glutton. I'm more of a glutton than, than a, I guess, a, a rage, a rage monkey. Yeah. I'm also, I feel like a sloth a lot of times, but. Okay, well, Peter didn't teach you. The thing is, what I've determined from talking to a lot of people who purportedly know about, about an egram or anagram or whatever, is that there are a variety of different interpretive aspects to it or meanings to it that sometimes run afoul of each other. Nobody's quite clear what to do when they conflict or why or which to prefer or why. So you say it, if you don't have a straight then it's pointless. Well, okay, I mean, but the thing is, Peter, what I'm saying is um, I want to understand like why five is necessarily the way it is in terms of something else, okay? In a enneagram, 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 enneagram. I think it's it's like a tomato tomato sort of situation, really. I've heard it said both ways. I mean, you probably just heard of me saying it wrong. Um, have you ever done a video on objective personality? Yeah, I've I've done I have. I I, I believe Peter Dantici that it's, I I am open to the possibility that there is a single correct interpretation of enneagram. Okay, but I am not. I am not. I've yet to hear it. Okay, I've yet to hear anybody make an adequate case for why one given interpretation is correct over another. How we can. How we can link this enough to empirics or something else that we can meaningfully validate or falsify it against anything other than itself and some correlate externally, right? You're an eight wing seven. You're destined to be a Disney villain. <laughs> what is MBTA good for if you're not a map maker? I mean, the thing is, as I've explained before, psychology needs a paradigm shift. In other words, in the status quo, there's no clear understanding of what its subject matter is exactly. There's no, there's no topmost frame through which to understand everything else that occurs in psychology. The thing that provides that frame is cognitive functions. And the reason it provides that frame is it explains not only all the different things we see in psychology, but why a given psychologist is focusing on this 
framing it in this fashion and or pathologizing and or failing to pathologize something that somebody else likes to pathologize. Basically, there's an ongoing battle in, in psychology as to, as to what comprises pathology when we can't articulate um, a true mental illness. In other words, disorders. So the thing is, we need something that withstands logical scrutiny, and we need something that withstands scientific scrutiny to function as the meta frame for psychology. Currently, you've got all these different schools, such as behaviorists, you know, basically various schools of thought that range along the range of particularist to universalist in basically expressing function biases uh, in, their, in their analysis without being able to account for that function bias themselves. Now, like everything in the world that's true and complicated, it takes a while for its concepts to be broken down into NI enough communicable chunks that, uh, that everybody starts to get some gist of it. Like, there was a time when nobody really understood what relativity was. And then, nowadays, everybody's got some understanding of it, you know, or a lot of people do. Some gist of what it means will at least give you a wrong approximation of 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 it. it could probably cite you the the equation e equals mc squared right so the thing is the frame is at ad adaptation but everyone wants to put a copyright on claiming being right i mean that's not true is the thing that, that's the funny thing jeremiah i'm the only one who wants to make that claim apparently isn't that, isn't that interesting? I'm not hearing the other people say they are exclusively right. Instead, they'll talk about, well, we're talking about the same thing through different frames of reference and these are different interpretations and whatever. I'm the only one who's talking like somebody who actually is trying to get it right. <laughs> Namely, I'm saying, no, this is something that's got a right explanation and, and the alternative to a right explanation and nothing else, you know? So... So, uh, I'm the only one who wants to put a copyright on claiming being right, because I don't really want to put a copyright on it. Uh, for the most part, everybody wants to ignore that elephant in the room. Thanks, darling. You're welcome. Some steak left, too, probably. Okay. Um, you know, it's like, that. they want to ignore that elephant in the room. Why? Because they don't feel equipped to, to win the arguments. It is an uncrustable, yeah. It's one of nature's finest fruits. They're uncrustable because they're easy, quick. It's basically like food cube, you know. It's my dream, food cube. Except it's saucery rather than cubey. still taste the winter chill on them. Wise man, Legends Paul, wise man. I mean, the thing is, 
it's very plausible to disagree with me about specifics. I know I'm sometimes wrong about specifics in the sense of this. Like, I might get somebody wrong in the typing. I'm not 100%. I'm getting closer to 100%. I'm feeling closer to 100%. But I know I'm not 100%. I can come up with examples of people I've typed before and then retyped them and was wrong the first time, you know? So it's like, I... But, but my point is that... You should be able to win those arguments without us disagreeing about anything on the framework, you know? <coughs> so, I sometimes am not, not, I'm not, I may be the best at applying my understanding to figure out your type, but I'm not perfect at it. And that's another reason to believe that I know what I'm talking about, you know? Like, I understand the parts I don't understand quite, you know? I understand where there are, where there are, would be, would be really useful to have some clear kind of subject Q slash mugity mu, but there just isn't one, and you have to use kind of approximations instead, and it makes the calculations of, of kind of, um, process of elimination more challenging than ideally it would be. Of course, on the plus side is if we ever do figure it out so that it can be easily done by anybody, I guess that means I'm, I'm out of a job, right? <laughs> not that that would, not that that would prevent me from trying to explain it, like, I continue to, but, uh, you know, some people are tricky. I, I thought that both those last two sisters were a little tricky. The first one was a little less tricky than the second one. Um, it was Rebecca and, um, well, I, I have to type you again, Mark, to know for sure. It's been a long time since I've tried to type you. But, um, So, um, the other thing is I'm improving and the problem with leaving a long record of work is that I haven't gone and cleaned up my mistakes. You can, you can trace back my, my growth from articulating mistakes I've made in the past that I no longer make and correct it on and stuff. Or you could just highlight those mistakes and say, see, you're contradicting yourself depending on how you want to frame it. Right. Um, it can also be confusing because there's, there, it's not, you can't reliably assume that something I said three years ago is correct, but you also can't reliably assume it's incorrect. You have to parse it out against what I now explain, which is asking a lot of people, right? I mean, I'm not asking it explicitly, but if you want to really be correct and you've been paying attention for a while, you have to be paying attention kind of on an ongoing basis to keep track of of how how I change somewhat the ways I think and express about cognitive functions. <sighs> Look, I, I, I'm not Peter. I'm not saying that it's that it's not possible, plausible that Enneagram has a clear singular explanation, but I just don't know what it is, and I haven't heard it expressed. So, it's been kind of a 
lovely couple of days here in Los Angeles. We had some rain. When was it? Yesterday? The day before? Uh, yesterday, right? I think so, yeah. And we really made a point of cozying it up. We did. Accordingly, today's been a more of a adventure in sunshine. And consequently, we've been a little more active. Done some SI stuff. No, the background is not live. The background is a, I think, seven or something second clip. And maybe 20 seconds. I don't remember exactly how long the clip is. Uh, leaves blowing. And if you'd like to... Uh, if you'd like to hear it, here's what it sounds like. Pretty spooky. Yeah, so however long it is. Hi, Sheila. It's pretty spectacular, pretty seasonal for uh, mid mid October's Tuesday evening. Well, because first I said seven seconds, and then I remembered I think I'm thinking about the another one. Uh, Eric, is it out of the ordinary for a concrete type to be predominantly focused on metaphysical subjects? I mean, predominantly focused is the key expression there. So, do you mean spending most of their time reading a bunch of stuff and or talking about and or researching in a literal sense, like most hours in the day? Or do you mean, are you talking more of a jumping fish kind of thing? So, INTP is predominantly focused on metaphysical subjects. What that means is, unless they have some job that pulls them away from it, or some other responsibilities they attend to, then, um, then, then you're not really talking about somebody who's predominantly focused on metaphysical subjects. So what that means is that they'll, you know, INTPs will sit there all day long in front of their computer, all day every day, either researching stuff or watching things or playing video games or whatever, and and so that's and you know they'll spend large chunks of that time going down philosophical rabbit holes and studying kind of abstract philosophical things, almost unavoidably. So, the the question is, like, predominantly focused on metaphysical subjects compared to what? What Jens Paul points out is generally a great question to ask. And what do you consider metaphysical subjects? Because then there's, like, Rachel's expression of predominantly being focused on metaphysical subjects looks very different than an INTP's. She's still absorbed in her devices all the time. But it's with different kind of media, you know, and she's not probably uh, reading Heidegger. She's more likely to be um, listening to a lady on YouTube talk about, like, you know, symbolic meanings, basically. Yeah, like I'll uh, either be reading get a tarot reading like a pick a card reading i'll be watching or um stuff on like narcissistic abuse hmm. yeah so the thing about about that question about narcissism in general is i think a, an important an important question and something that you hear a lot of you hear a lot of um
I mean, Peter NCG, it also depends on how you're engaging with the information. So it's not just it's not just that you're engaging with the information, it's how you're engaging, right? It, it's like, it depends on how you're reading it, not just that you're reading it. That conjecture is somewhat in contrast to your dad choosing to study philosophy. Well, my, my point is, it's about how you're doing it rather than what you're doing, really. How was my dad studying philosophy? Well, he was studying it very, in a very TE fashion and in a very instrumental, for very ma instrumental reasons, uh, within a very TE frame of reference, wanting to probably get it, a raise at work, that automatically came because of the contract. It was like a state employee or whatever, or a county employee, all that kind of stuff, you know? There were a lot of practicalities for him, I think, that came into play with that. Plus, he he viewed philosophy as the rationalist alternative to theism of some sort. And uh, and he, he... My dad never embraced the kind of, like... So, it's like, you know, if you're engaging in the same, an NI DOM will engage the same, take one hour of engaging information, the same information, and you take an NI DOM, an NE DOM, an SI DOM, a TE DOM, an FI DOM, blah, blah, blah. You can get all of those people to engage with that information for an hour. And if you just say, engage with this as you feel like it, or as, as you want to, like, in other words, there's no test or anything after the fact. People will pay attention to it in varying ways. So if you're looking for NI magic bits that you think connect to this great hole that you can't really explain, then that's what you'll find. And if you're looking for reasons to negate this because it doesn't satisfactorily withstand scrutiny, then that's what you'll find. If you're looking for... Uh, of course... Of course, with uh, with with like that with the last thing with the, like scrutiny, you might you might find that there's not reason to dismiss it. You know, you kind of go in expecting to, there to be reason. You check for for in for discrepancies and stuff, right? But you might go in there checking to make sure that the person is being fe open, which is to say they're they're inviting you to be a participant in this. They're pretending to present information that's from a third party, for example, is one way to avoid an ego competition thing. So to the extent that I were able to... It's a strategy C.S. Joseph uses, right? Well, you know, if when in doubt, hey, it's not me. I'm not the source of this information. I'm not claiming authorship. I'm just teaching... I'm just teaching you this information that I've learned from this master guru knowledge person, right? It's much more challenging if you're saying that this is this is stuff that, by and large, you know, a lot of the specifics are things I've figured out, quote unquote, <coughs> or generated, <coughs> or conceptualized in some way. <coughs> to the extent that I'm I'm claiming authorship or appear to be, it's going to run afoul specifically of FE stuff, potentially of FI stuff, um, and potentially even of NI in the sense that it would seem inconsistent with reality that uh, one party out of all of these would be exclusively right, etc. Unless you want to frame it in certain ways, so. Would you like this jacket washed? Uh, is it dirty? I don't think it is. Do okay. you think it is? I don't know. I have no idea. No, I don't think it's dirty. Okay. So the other thing is certain objects, because we can limit the scope of an object, it might sort of insist that it be 
it might sort of insist that it be properly dealt with in a certain modality. If, if I put you in a room with a football versus I put you in a room with a table with a piece of paper and some, some math questions on it with some blank spaces next to it, we can all predict what the person is going to do, right? Most people are going to, at some point, toss the football in the football room, and most people, at some point, are going to write some things down on this piece of paper because that's what's required of you attentionally by the situation, so to speak. But the extent to which, how they're going to attend to the fact that they're doing these things, what those things, doing doing those things mean, and etc., and um, how naturally they'll feel, you know, acclimated to the kind of things they're doing is going to depend on on type. You want this blue jacket uh, washed as well? Sure. You just want an answer from me, huh? No, because I'm doing it now. So. Okay, then yes, please. Thank okay. you. You're welcome. And can you please check the pockets and make sure nothing's in there before you put them in the wash? Okay, I try to. Okay, thank you. I wasn't saying you didn't normally. I just. Oh no, I know. I I sometimes I forget. Like the last time, I definitely forgot to check. Thank you. Okay. So the thing is, it's it's. A reality that we that people render into physical objects the various tools that they find more most attentionally valuable if I if I find the throwing of things and the catching of things most attentionally valuable then I'm going to be inclined to direct my attention to finding making creating shaping using the throwing and catching of things and so that's just how it goes, right? If instead I'm I'm interested in writing words down on paper, then I'll be drawn to those rooms that have paper in them, not those rooms that have footballs in them, to the extent that I'm afforded choice. One of the big problems with with school is that we keep telling children to to go into rooms that require certain kinds of attentional manners and pretend as though they don't require a certain kind of attentional manners and expect everybody to be neutral on all these these kind of um, vectors, but it's not that way. And so since most of the rooms are going to validate with some kinds of attention more than others and some kinds of attention consistently get a, get a short shrift in that environment, you end up with, with some pretty messed up people. People get pretty messed up in school, you know? Well, okay, so Legend Falls says, if you put me in a room with football and a piece of paper with math problems, I'll definitely ignore the math the whole time. In that instance, time spent is absolutely informative. <laughs> well, that, that would be a good test, I guess. Uh, I'd probably doodle on the back of the math paper. If I had to wait, you know, it's like, here, you're waiting in this room for something, and you have to wait 45 minutes, and you know you're going to have to wait a while, and the only thing there are in there is a ball and a piece of paper and a pencil, and the piece of paper has a math problems on it. I might do a couple of them just to, to see, like, before I go, like, why am I doing these math problems? <laughs> Depending on how hard they are, if they're a challenge enough to do. I'll be like, what, is this some sort of, like, secret code thing or something? What is this shit? You know, I'd wonder about it. I'd wonder and I'd worry. I'd squander and I'd squirry. And, uh, and then I'd probably get up at some point and throw the ball around a little bit. You know, I'd probably do that, too. Because I'm not a ball hater. I wouldn't say I'm a ball lover, but I'm not a ball hater. Um, I definitely wouldn't, almost certainly would not fold the paper into a paper airplane because I'm accustomed to to thinking about paper as a resource to write on and how you never know when you're going to need a piece of paper to jot something down. So you shouldn't, you shouldn't, like don't write all big on a piece of paper so because then you're eliminating its use for future notations.
<laughs> yeah. Legend Small says, if someone else was doing the math problems, I'd try to do them better and faster. And you'd probably succeed, I suspect, Legends Full. One thing that I've noted uh, about Delilah and me is Delilah is way faster at doing Sudokus, Sudokus than me. Um, <laughs> I mean, if you're an HP stock investor, then you probably got better SI than most better relationship with your SI than most ENTPs and your TE because I would expect ENTPs to be kind of interested in day trading maybe um, but to I don't think I don't think it's a good it's a lack of NI right it's NI ignoring that um, I think is a problem for ENTPs when I give somebody else advice about what to invest in, they generally should listen to me. I don't give it very often, but I, uh, <laughs> new group. Is that a double entendre? Are you using French words with an RE at the end? You know, I, you know, I have a problem with that, right? <coughs> no entendres. That would be an example of poor TE or poor TE, I guess. Oh. Is the sensible thing to do since you only, you only had one coin, and she instead of saying, "Can you put this in the piggy bank?" she said, "Can you get the piggy bank?" So I reached the piggy bank, brought it over, and then she put one coin in it. No, it wasn't one coin. It was three. Oh, it was three coins. Yeah. My mistake. It's all right. Um, tricky question. Did you think, what what should I do? Should I ask him to put the coins in or should I ask him to hand me the piggy bank? No. No? Interesting. It's Bag the, the pretzels? The tide for the laundry. Oh. Okay. So wouldn't that be indicative of TV pool or like I like messed up that step? Yeah, well, I mean, you sort of forgot about it. It's sort of an SI problem. I see this other thing oh, where, where you, uh, with the piggy bank, is more instructive because it's. It, it only goes TE as far as this. In order for me to put this into the piggy bank, I need the piggy bank closer to me. And it doesn't take into, it doesn't even take into account the TE question of what's the most efficient way to get this to the piggy bank. It just takes into the question, how do I get it so I can put the, this, I'm trying to put this in the piggy bank. It's too far away for me to reach. And there's this stuff here, what should I do, right? And so it just attacks the first layer of question. Which is, um, how do I get that piggy bank close enough to me to put the money in? So then I bring it over the, to her to her and she puts the money in. Even though it would have been overall more efficient for her to give me the coins and tell me to put them in the piggy bank. Uh, anyway, it doesn't matter. That's, that's just an explanation of, of TE folder. How would an ENTP and an INTP differ as lawyer and which would be better in which areas of being a lawyer? Um, I mean, I would guess that an INTP lawyer would be, would probably be better at negotiating settlements and stuff, and the ENTP lawyer would be better at, at winning, at winning, like, uh, 
win-loss cases. You know, if, if you want to go to trial, you want your ENTP lawyer. If you don't want to go to trial, you want an INTP lawyer. I would guess if you had to generalize a rule like that, that would be a good rule to generalize. But putting the money in the piggy bank is rather an SI thing. Well, I mean, Rachel and I both have learned around here, or come to think of it as part of cleaning up in general. Um, she saw me earlier putting coins in there as part of cleaning up, and so it's like... I don't know if that was her way of doing dealing with coins on her own, but around here, she knows that's where they go, you know? And so, uh... I guess it's an SI thing. I, I think of it as a... Yeah, an SITE thing. Keeping all the like things together is basic, a basic SITE heuristic. So, keep all the petroleum-based products together. If you followed that rule, you'd have your gasoline, your oil, your motor oil, your um, WD-40, and you'd also have your Vaseline there, you know. So, it, there's, if you were to try to to come up with an S-I-T-E, I guess, uh, conditional web, like, uh, if an object is primarily made out of petroleum, exclude its possible locations from the kitchen, and then you might have to make some exceptions, you know, like, it would be interesting to try to make that kind of a, of a, I guess, a model that projects where a, given lo where a given item is likely to be kept, given, given that you know, like, qualities of it, but not its name. You have a five-gallon water jug for your piggy bank. You're excited to see how full and heavy and Cadillac amount once it is full. Yeah, I mean, that's a lot of coins. They do come with a back door, um, but they didn't used to necessarily. And historically, the idea is you can put things in, but you can't get them up, right, until it's full or until you break it open. Breaking it seems outrageous. Yeah, sure. Let's uh, let's discuss it. I mean, I like the idea of planning something in June for for Vegas. I think it's a good idea. Yeah, regular modern piggy banks do have a rubber plug. I will tell you, when I was a kid, and my parents and I would travel down to Tijuana back before it was dangerous and it was kind of a um. Mexico theme park, <laughs> uh, for lack of a better word. Uh, I think that would probably be the best descriptor of, of Tijuana back in the 70s. Mexico theme park. Well, one of the things we'd always get on the way back from Tijuana was a large piggy bank that didn't have those plug in it. It just had a slit in the top, and it was clay. And my mom would always fill it up, and then... Come Christmas time, she'd crack it open and they'd have a yeah, amount of money saved up and etc. A stand in for FI. If you had better use of FI, you wouldn't feel the need to be better than everyone else at everything. Right. 
I mean, Legends following these good observations about FP third. Um, and the thing is, I guess it's like there's just a, basically a lack of self worth that goes along with F five in general in, in in the polar, you know. It's like it's very difficult to understand one's own value except in terms of utility to others, which I think links to that six slot counter value T E, you know. Thoughts on mycelium? I don't know what it is. I have no thoughts of it uh, thoughts about it as a consequence. Mycelium. I don't think that's right, Jonathan Basanti. I don't think it's defeating others that makes you feel better. I think it's it's succeeding. And to the extent that success is zero sum, then it's more real in some sense. In other words, both people have, have skin in the game. And on that ground, it's more satisfying. But that's not the same thing as as making yourself feel good because other people are you make other people feel bad or something it, it just, I don't I don't buy that explanation at all Hi Jalen The thing is it's like it seems to me that if you think about school for example in your third slot F8 On, on some level, it seems they tell you, if you, if you outcompete the others, you'll be rewarded. But when you try to outcompete the others, you realize they're competing at this really boring slow game called steady follow through on ordinary things. You know. Uh, any th similar thoughts on Polar TE? I mean, I think, I think Polar TE has as its, just as Polar FI has as its core fear-based assumption that I have no value outside of my utility, I think Polar TE has as its core fear-based assumption I am useless. And it's to the extent that a person's expressing insecurity based on their, their polar, it's because their environment is trying to just to force them to justify themselves against that metric. And um, so it's like Rachel feels most comfortable in an environment that demands the least utility of her, regardless of how much utility she provides. She'd like to be comfortable knowing that um, she can, uh, she doesn't have to, she doesn't have to do more than FI in order to be valuable. Just like I don't have to do more than TE in order to be valuable, right? It's like, I don't want an environment to demand of me, um, demanded me value other than utility. I don't even understand what it is exactly, right? Like, um, it, it, we're talking about, for me right now, are challenging things to explain or talk about because you can see how tangled up I get talking about my seven slot function when it gets in the mix there. I get confused easily. How valuable are second and tertiary functions in MBTI given that we already working from a primary approximation dichotomy that's just over extrapolation? 
Well, my answer to that, Chris, is <clears throat> anytime we talk about the first, fourth, fifth, or eighth slot function, we're talking about the first slot function from one different angle or another, okay? And anytime we talk about the second, third, fourth, I mean, second, third, fifth, and sixth function, sixth and seventh function, second, third, sixth, and seventh functions, we're talking about the second function from a certain angle. So, in other words, six slot TE is just another way of saying second slot TI. Um, third, third slot FE is just another way of saying second slot TI. Polar FI is just another way of saying second slot TI. Same thing with the dominant function. Fifth slot NI is just another way of saying expert intuition dominant. Okay? So, but do I think it's bad that we have divided it into eight functions? No, because it is true that to meaningfully communicate about how what it means to be an extroverted intuitor, I have to express in some way my relationship with a the alternatives. If I if I don't have the thing divided into um, to teeter totters in some sense, uh, then I'm not meaningfully explaining how the attentional manner is a manner of attention. Because to pay attention to something is necessarily definitionally conceptually to ignore things that are not that thing, right? It's like, um, otherwise I'm not paying attention to anything, I'm just open to whatever, right? Which is sort of different. So, the thing is, when we talk about, when I talk about being four slot SI, what I really mean is being an expert in intuition dominant means I have this relationship with my physical experience as a, as an animal being and with my memory of experiences or my impression of subjective experiences and stuff like that, that I have a non-universalist kind of knowing that I begin first with um, with examples and then check to see if they generalize into rules. So it's like, that's, it's a different way that then, it's a, it's a different checking order than, than NI types, right? And that, that different checking order seems to be true no matter where in the conscious stack SI is or NI. In other matters, it might be very contingent on where it is in the stack. Like, what I remember, what kind of things I remember and how I remember them is going to be defined very much by being an NE DOM, my relationship with SI in terms of words and stuff. Um, and if I'm an SI DOM, my relation, what I'm going to remember is going to be much more linked to that function than is linked to extroverted intuition. In other words, I'm going to remember shit that extroverted intuition finds useful, extroverted intuitors find useful, not shit that introverted sensors find useful. And since introverted sensing is a knowledge function in and of itself, I'm kind of using the the less natural aspects of it. So it, it, depending on how we understand the function, we, we either can or can't understand certain parts of it without referencing other functions, right? It is possible to understand certain parts of it is sort of universalist as indicated by the SI front stack, SI back stack, example to generality versus generality to example. Um, but by and large, uh, to meaningfully understand it, you have to express it in terms of uh, mia at the expense of mia. Don't try to make somebody feel bad. That's not being very nice to verify. You gotta touch the gentle moisture, cover it with dew, and stroke it very gently. I love you. Okay, Eli? That's a message from my heart through her heart to your heart, back again to my heart, and then back to her heart again. All the way around.
Oh, Peter didn't teach you, don't feel sad. And eat a lousy, yes, the end, you're mad. Cause Winston's mom and Legends fall, and also Lady Lou. They're all so much in love with y'all, and though much, yeah, it's true. It's all good and soft and gentle, full of F.I. and some flowers, full of sunshine, full of rainbows and some laughter. Isn't that good? Do you all feel reassured now? I know I do. Thanks, darling. I appreciate it. Yeah, I should make a type please episode. <laughs> I don't say your NI sucks. I just say it's a little overzealous, okay? You know, there's nothing wrong with, with being with being enthusiastic and doing your job. Uh it's just sometimes You don't want to uh, assume your that your drug sniffing dog can also identify whether a girl's privacy has recently been douched. Those are different matters. Don't let the drug sniffing dog determine whether or not your girl has recently douched. Good advice for us all. Amen. Even if your dog does not bark at your girl and it turns out she passes whatever test it is that we just described, you will you will be amazed to determine and see the delightful things that happen. <laughs> I don't know what to say. <laughs> totally losing my train of thought with all this stuff in the live chat here. <laughs> yeah. You know what? I like notice that sometimes my NI is off. I forget what it was off with. Oh, um. Like, I didn't think my brother was going to get married so soon he's like very methodical in what he does um, but that's exactly why he got married uh, is getting married next year because he's so methodical so my and I was wrong I thought he would like I don't know, take two years to be engaged and then get married, but so I was wrong. <laughs> ENTJs seem the most difficult type to understand. Maybe it's just because they're rare, rather rarely discussed. We can give it give a quick ENTJ in a nutshell. Um I mean <clears throat> they're all quite the same. They're 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 very comfortable with their polar being their polar they like it being their polar they don't like si stuff in general their eyes glaze over as soon as you start telling them any kind of si anecdote um they don't retain details that don't seem relevant or linked to in intuitive understandings of things um they you know it's like what did you have for dinner last night fish what kind of fish what am i a fish expert um <laughs> You know, that, that lady I typed, she thought that was hilarious because she was, as an ISTJ, thought that was the most hilarious thing she'd ever seen because who would be so crazy as to not know what kind of fish they ate? You know, it's really reflective of SI Dom laughing at SI Polar's SI Polariness, you know? Um, and the other thing is the appearance of of Kevin here today, the ENTJ, is contraindicative, uh, like, it's it's not normal, but the fact, the way that he came in, specifically with a question about how to, man looking for, for some sort of way to manipulate somebody, that's textbookly consistent with, but normally, ENTJs, once I type them, you might see them once in a while, but most of all, they're mostly they get what they're going to get out of cognitive functions. They glean whatever utility they think they can glean from it. 
and they use that in other aspects of their life and move on. They're not usually here in the typology community to make friends, hang around, represent their type or anything like that. I'm feeling a little bit meow overall. You too? A little meow? Yeah, I'm a little depressed, you know. Why are you depressed? Um... Well, I guess I really started... Feeling the meat of it when I knock this tooth out. Yeah. That's pretty unfortunate. Yeah, it's very unfortunate. And it was like, ah. mm, I'm sorry. In general, I just sort of feel like we're kind of a little stalled in the doldrums. I don't know. Waiting for something to happen um, so of course it also has a lot to do with with where 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 I am in a bottle of Adderall I'm today I have a little bit of Adderall in me but not much and And it's still kind of, like, <coughs> I still kind of have an overall, like, sleepy, weak mentality, I guess. I just feel kind of down. Just kind of. Yeah. Yeah, just kind of, yeah. So. I'm sorry. It's not your fault. In some ways, it's been a very nice couple of days. We've been pretty chill. Yeah. I guess I just still don't really feel feel as up to live streaming as I expected to. Watch in the army now with Pauly Shore. I you know, Rebecca, you get at least ten to fifteen points for recommending a Pauly Shore film to yeah. us. That's happened so rarely. Let's do it. Thanks, Rebecca Corm. Mayor. Polly Shore is such an interesting phenomenon, isn't it? Yeah. He? Like. Have I tried vitamins? <laughs> Chris. Are you joking? Vitamins. Yeah, yeah, this is just a slowdown. This is a normal mood, mood dehancing slowdown period. But, you know, we've been sleeping a lot the last few days. Both Rachel and I have been mm -hmm. sleeping our little behinds off. And, uh, it takes a lot of sleep to sleep your little behind off. Like, pff, long ass time. I'm not on any SSRIs, Chris, okay? I'm on D-R-U-T-I's. Dopamine reuptake inhibitors. So, you can stick your SSSRs in your pipe and shove it. I'm supposed to work with Jeffrey at 7, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Paul. I don't want to talk about dumbass Paul. How boring. So boring. Yeah, the dopamine does need to replenish. That's where the sleep comes in. So it's like... 
They won't. SSRI and Adderall combined will kill you. That's not true. Isn't uh, Prozac an SSRI? I don't know. I think so. If you named your wiener Cookie after the last show you watched, what would he, she, they be called? Gorilla? I don't know what to make of that. <laughs> no, Adderall doesn't affect the airtime very much at all, I don't think. Benzos affect serotonin, I think. And, um... Basic fuel... I mean... You gotta remember something. The average American in their various diet has a vast a TV. plentitude, abundance of varying foods, vitamins, minerals, etc. That, that no other generation in history has ever been able to in, enjoy the, the, the bounty of Earth in such a fashion as the average person always does. You know. Am I a poetry mm -hmm. fan? I like to write poetry. I don't know if that counts as being a poetry fan or not. Hmm. That's a good question. Let's see, yeah. All right, here we go. It was a hundred thousand million years ago. It was a hundred thousand million years ago, time ran slow, nobody yet to show plant the slabs below, and let them go, they will start to grow, more years into a new dash and through, a holy slabs come into view, unchangingly true, eternally new, but when the slope appears in charge today, options I don't know the chord. 
is. I don't remember exactly how to play it. Ever, so, ever since I started doing aromatherapy, I've not needed any drugs. Oh my gosh. I think that was such an improvement for you. All I do is smell amphetamines, marijuana, and tobacco a lot. Oh, I see. It's a trifecta. It's a trifecta of aromatherapy. Ooh, that sounds like... I, I microdose by macrodosing. Ooh, microdose by microdosing. By macrodosing, I'm able to microdose. It's basically like you microdose a lot of times all at once together. And that's how you microdose, but it's really like macrodosing. So you get the best of both worlds. It's for people who really understand things. <laughs> it's very important to really understand things. Would you like to sing along with me on this one? Yes. It's a very cloudy day in Los Angeles And today we run out of time Troubles past, troubles still to come Day is nearly done, someone buy us some more time Okay, okay, today, today, I think we're done by stream away. Thanks for being here. Don't forget to eat plenty of cheese. Cheese. And if you do forget, please remember next time to eat twice as many cheese. <laughs>